makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Investors await U.S. inflation data that will help clarify the path for Fed policy, or at least we hope the New York Fed president says rates are high enough to guide inflation back to target. A breakthrough for crypto as Bitcoin spot ETFs get the green light a decade after the first proposal, but the SEC warns the approval is not an endorsement. Plus, bumper grocery sales for two of Britain's biggest retailers over Christmas as inflation hit consumers spend on food rather than gifts. More on this and other stories in our weekly UK show. Now, first thing is first, so let's take a look at the markets, and this is what the European markets are telling us right now. Now, let me be very clear. These markets are in tender hooks because they're expecting that inflation data print out of the U.S. to give us an indication of what that means for the Fed, whether we cut as much as expected in the markets, whether there are less cuts, and, of course, this reprices and changes everything. For the moment, the CAC 40 gaining some six-tenths of 8%. The FTSE may have been into the eight-tenths of 8%. And, of course, some of the individual stock moves that will delve into a little bit deeper. Tesco up, for example, after it's raised its profit guidance and uh, Marks and Spencer dropping after its third quarter sales reports. But to talk about inflation, treasuries, data and everything in between, talk about the markets. Uh, joining us now is Lucy Baldwin, Global Head of Research and Equity Advisory at Citigroup. Lucy, so, so good to see you. So thank you so much for coming on. It's a big day. It's, it's a huge day, but I feel like the main question is whether you think the markets will start tracking maybe some of the data a little bit in, instead of just believing that there are cuts coming no matter what. Yes, good morning, Francine. Great to see you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We had the everything rally at the back end of last year, fueled by this sort of hope rain eternal theme, whereby everybody thought, OK, it's fine. We're going to get these sort of insurance cuts. We're going to get cuts early. Our view is quite different to that. We actually don't think that's going to be the case. And we think the risk as we look into this year is uh, that you get a recession. We actually think that you're going to see cuts more towards the second half of the year. So the kind of concept that you'll get a potential cut in March to us feels like too much excitement too quickly for the U.S. market. So the big theme for us is this delay in the easing cycles really coming through this year. And that's what we're expecting to see for the U.S., but also for some other key markets around the world, too. And you're absolutely right. We do think think that the data is going to become much, much more important <laughs> rather than moving in advance of that data. Yeah, I mean, so it's, uh, that will probably be a welcome relief by most. So what, is it because you're expecting actually inflation to fall less than expected? Or is it b because you have other worries about, about the economy that means that the Fed will hold back for now? Yeah, you know, our view really is that, yes, we've made tremendous progress around the world on inflation, but this kind of last mile, we think, is going to probably be a lot tougher than people think to really bring it down. And we do think that we've obviously seen at the back end of last year massive moves in terms of rates, right? Obviously, the move in the rates market is quite unusual. What we saw in the last two months is usually what you see when you're in a cutting cycle and when you're in a recession. So to have seen that then was quite surprising. And so to our minds, you know, that's created now quite a quite a sort of fuel really to the fire and the US doesn't need much more fuel in that fire as we know so we're actually really watching the data very carefully in particularly the consumer data of course you know what's happening with jobs and we can see already it's taking people longer to find that new job people are out of work longer the confidence has already started to dip and crucially I think you know as we press into the sort of end of the first half of this year, we think it could be quite non-linear the way that the labour market weakness manifests. So we're really watching that data set particularly closely. So are you actually expecting some kind of hard landing in the US? And we're in election year, so would you know, the Biden administration not throw everything at it? It's a great question. We have agonised over this, Francie, and we are probably the most bearish bank macro-wise on the street. So we do still forecast a recession for the US. Okay. It's a pretty mild recession, really, but we do nonetheless forecast one. And we think this kind of concept that you're going to see this soft landing is just too positive. So, you know, the view that you get a soft landing, but that you're also going to be getting cuts starting preemptively, yes. you know, in the, in the first part of this year, we think is a bit too optimistic, yeah. realistically. Uh, but that said, we're still pretty constructive on a lot of the major asset classes, despite a much more bearish macro view on where the US is going to be, but also where Europe is already and probably where the UK is going to go too. We're pretty bearish. OK, Lucy, we also heard from John Williams. So here's John Williams on price inflation. My base case is that the current restrictive stance of monetary policy will continue to restore balance and bring inflation back to our 2% longer run goal. 
I expect that we will need to maintain a restrictive stance of policy for some time to fully achieve our goals. So, Lucy, when you and you have a contrarian view, which actually used to be mainstream five, six months ago, yes. because I guess to get inflation down, the trickier part is always from like maybe three to two percent or three and a half to two and a half percent. Does that mean that a lot of other central banks will also be much more cautious? And is that because they worry about the credibility that actually if they don't go for inflation at two percent, it has longer term consequences? Yeah, we just think that, you know, what you've seen in terms of some of these easing of, of conditions at the back end of last year will yeah. also feed through. You know, we talked for ages about this lag in yeah. the tightening yeah. cycle and we're just sort of seeing that and now we're going to have a lag in the effective easing that we saw at the back end of the year mm -hmm. essentially so we just think it's going to take a while to come through and for a number of these central banks you know we just feel that that credibility is still an issue and they really do want to show that they've got inflation under control yeah. and they're not going to want to risk we don't think easing too early and certainly not when so much of the data is still quite strong. So hence our view for the U.S. that it's going to be really towards the end of the first half before you're going to see a cut. Uh, but our view, for example, in the U.K., is also that you know when you do see those cuts, they're going to come much more rapidly and there's right. going to be more cuts than the market actually expects. And a similar view for emerging markets, right? We're pretty bullish emerging markets. EM obviously had a pretty good year mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. probably the best year since 19 as an asset class. But in reality, we think th those cuts are going to need to come uh, yeah. you know, to, to a larger degree and more cuts at the, this year. So hence, for example, we're pretty bullish on EM rates as an example. So uh, what's your take? I mean, I could listen to you for like, ages, you know, you know, going around the world, which we'll also mention the, the European Central Bank shortly, but what does it mean for equities? So equities versus treasuries, how do you play that? Yeah, okay, so we, we obviously had a phenomenal year for, for lots of asset classes, right, around the world last year, you know, great year for equities, albeit obviously the S&P, 60% of that yeah. phenomenal performance was in the Magnificent Seven. You know, our view on the US market, for example, is reasonably constructive. We still think you're going to get a good 10% of upside in the US market this year. However, we think you're going to see a broadening out of earnings growth. And we think it's too simplistic just to own big cap, mega cap US names. We think people have to either think about an equal weight S&P or thinking about, you know, the beneficiaries of things like AI beyond just the Magnificent Seven. So we like equities. Um, in particular as well, I would say we think it's also important not just to own the US market. We think there's lots of opportunity in other places. We like the European equity market, for example, uh -huh. relative to the UK. UK has mm -hmm. obviously got much more of a defensive tilt within its market. So we see some value in Europe because, again, expectations for growth uh, is pretty low in Europe. So uh, we do see an opportunity there. And we do like a number of emerging market uh, equities as well. And what I would say is the big debate for us is, is China. So our equity strategist does see quite a bit of upside there. It's a phenomenally cheap market. And of course, managers over the last few years have really uh, cut back their allocation to China. So were that to change, then that could be quite a, a, a key market to watch over the course of this next year. So interesting. Lucy, thank you so much. Lucy Baldwin there from Citigroup, of course, stays with us. We'll have plenty more insights. We'll talk a little bit more maybe about their play on European equities. Now, two Bitcoin ETFs begin trading in U.S. pre-market. This is rather exciting after uh, we've had the trials and tribulations. OK, it's not doing much, but we did have trials and tribulations after the SEC account got hacked on X, saying that they approved the ETF Bitcoin. Then there were question marks what that meant uh, and when we would get the decision. In the end, they have decided to actually go ahead and give it a stamp of approval, but saying it is not an endorsement. So Bitcoin, for the moment, pretty much flat. This is a grayscale Bitcoin, uh, I think, pre-market. So, so we'll have plenty more on Bitcoin, what the ETF approval means for the future of crypto investing in general. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Now, U.S. regulators have finally given long-awaited approval to exchange traded funds investing directly in Bitcoin. Now, the move is seen as a landmark event for the digital asset sector with industry heavyweights, including BlackRock, Invesco and Fidelity, uh, given the go-ahead to launch funds. Now, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg senior crypto editor, Anna Herrera. Anna, is this exciting? Is this like a watershed moment or it's just been so, you know, it, it comes off the back of a really difficult year for Bitcoin? It does. I mean, it did pick up a difficult period for crypto, I guess, in general, right? But it's hard to see how it's not sort of a big deal. They do, in the end, you have these big giants like BlackRock attaching their name to the asset class. 
so it's hard to dismiss it. We didn't have the big price pop that people were hoping, no. though. So I don't but know. But we what had it the day before, yeah, because of the hacking of the account yeah. of the SEC. But it hasn't gone to 50, so we'll see what the next driver will be. It's it's definitely interesting. I guess the whole point is, will people start allocating now? Will they put money into this now that it's much easier? Will they say we'll have one percent of this portfolio will be with crypto because it's easier and we trust the issuer? I mean, even if it's one percent, is this a game again? How much you know? It's it, a game changer. Right? It, it could, yeah. You you could have now mass more mass market investment into crypto but again is there appetite that that's the main thing we have to see right like it, surely it's gone up a lot compared to where we were a year ago with all those bankruptcies and it was down to below 20 and now it's back up and, and again it's not dead considering everything that happened it's quite surprising and we're talking about it and it's like considered an asset class so surely it's come a long way yeah so what I'm still struggling to understand and I've had a couple of experts come on and say well experts I mean they're, they're in the space in saying well if they give it the stamp of approval it means they're happy with the fact that it's a clean asset right that they don't see anything too dodgy in it but the SEC went out of their way in saying it's not an endorsement so I think Partly it's because, as we know, crypto moves so much on sentiment and social media. It's, it's, it's a thing of, on its own. And so I think they were very careful to say, we're approving it, but we're not saying you should buy it. And I think maybe it, it, it's normal to think, of, think that in other asset classes, like if they approve, you know, like an IPO, they're not saying you should buy this IPO. But with Bitcoin, there was so much running on it that they thought, Let, let's be clear that we're saying you can list it, but we're not advising anyone to buy it. But does it change? Does it mean that they've taken to Curacao, you know, that it could go to zero to 2000 and that's unlikely or what is the judgment on? I, I guess the main concern they had was that the price could be manipulated. Right. And that there was no way to check that the, the exchange didn't have sufficient controls. And then they got there, there was a lawsuit and it was shown they were able to demonstrate that actually, you know, the futures and the cash sort of like the prices are sort of varying. So if you, you've allowed futures uh, ETFs, then you should be allowing cash uh, ETFs. So that's that, that, that was the main point, right? They, I guess maybe they couldn't fight it off any longer. Yeah, because it has been quite a long time in the making. Anna, thank you so much. I also got a crash course uh, by Anna this morning on how to find it, because it's not easy to find <laughs> the, the futures of uh, this, this new Bitcoin ETF. Our Bloomberg senior crypto editor, Anna Irrera. Now, let's get back to the markets um, with Lucy Baldwin, global head of research and equity advisor at Citigroup. And Lucy, thank you for sticking around. We really went through you know, what you're expecting from the Fed, which is a bit of an outlier call. In terms of where you see value, I think European equities um, is one where, where you see, the, at the same time, the ECB is trying to maybe accelerate QT. So what does that, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, no, look, I mean, for us, a big theme this year is obviously the geopolitics, right? So you've got half of the world's po you know, population going to the polls uh, to vote. So that complexity and uncertainty for us as well means you need that diversification, right? And again, with the equities theme that we're playing, although we're overweight equities in aggregate, um, what I would say is that, yes, Europe is going to offer one of those main pockets of value because it's obviously a market where expectations are so low. Mm -hmm. We, like others, do see that easing coming through, particularly in the second half of the year, about 100 bips of cups from the ECB. Um, we don't really see that there's a major risk of like a double dip recession in Europe. We actually see that there's some attractiveness there in that market and some stability coming back. I mean, China's going to be a big call cool, really for Europe because of the importance of that market and I think you know again what happens there in terms of stimulus how much easing you get coming through and sort of coordinated monetary and fiscal response there is also going to play into Europe so we like Europe we see quite a bit of opportunity there. I mean, again, what I'd just say is that, you know, this sort of broad theme of diversification, right? We like government debt uh, pretty much all over the world, right? We like U.S. real rates. We like uh, rates in Europe. We like EM. We think, although they had a good performance last year, we think that can run this year, given that theme of where we are in terms of that uh, cycle, in terms of cutting coming through and the magnitude of some of those cuts. But we also really like equities, you know, and, and the, the sort of opposite side of that equation is we're much more cautious credit globally, right? We haven't seen any major weakness coming through in that asset class yet other than obviously the regional bank wobbles and the REITs uh, wobbles the real estate wobbles in the US in particular but most of those areas are sort of recovered now um, so we're still pretty cautious we're watching that closely but that in a way is our recession hedge mm -hmm. along with of course the fact that gold is a great recession hedge and again we think there's a lot of support for something like gold next this next year yeah. because of you've got the underlying central bank 
uh, buying support as well as it having pretty light positioning, Francine. Uh, uh, and Lucy, very quickly, I mean, when you were talking about China, you say this is one of the most important but difficult calls to, yes. to make. Yeah. I mean, are, are there points in the year that you're looking for to try and understand whether, I mean, we even have an economy that's fully reopening or whether they put enough money to, to I guess, cushion some of the downfall in property and elsewhere? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we expect China to come out and confirm about a 5% GDP target mm -hmm. again for this year. We're broadly there. We're about 4.6% okay. yep. growth for this year, but there's some major uh, unknowns to debate, you know, and how much the new economy segments around tech, advanced manufacturing and modern infrastructure can really pick up the slack of the property sector, because as we know, it's been about a third of GDP and how quickly those new segments can really pick up the slack. It's going to be absolutely critical. And issues to watch are things like youth unemployment, which remains incredibly high. Um, and that really is that mismatch in skills, right? You've got a lot of manufacturing jobs that are open, 25, 30 million jobs probably open there. But actually, those aren't the jobs that those young people want. And so how that gets managed is important. And I think the messaging, of course, around stimulus is going to be critical. Our view really is that this isn't going to be a sort of consumption-led recovery. And it's going to take a long time before you get consumption levels back to pre-COVID. So this is going to have to be more of an investment-led stabilization slash recovery in China as they start to think about that balance between reforms and stimulus. Because those reforms coming through is really what's going to be long term critical to help get investor confidence back in that market because again as we know that's at very very low levels. so those are some of the things that we're watching for is the narrative around reforms yeah. and stimulus and how that starts to come through this year lucy thank you so much for joining us today lucy baldwin they're a global head of research and equity advisory at citigroup now coming up anthony blinken heads to egypt for more talks aimed at containing the israel hamas war this as the international court of justice begins hearing a case brought against Israel for its actions in Gaza. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken travels to Egypt today for more talks aimed at stopping Israel's war against Hamas from escalating into a wider conflict. Now, in the Red Sea, tensions remain high with the U.S. and its allies weighing options for retaliation against Houthi attacks on merchant ships. Now, this comes as the U.N.'s International Court of Justice begins hearing a case brought by South Africa, which calls on Israel's actions in Gaza to be ruled as genocide. Israel has denied the allegations. Authorities in the Hamas-run territory say at least 22,000 people have been killed since the start of the war. Now, we're joined by Mark Champion, our international affairs columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. Mark, um, thank you for joining us. And your columns are measured. They give a different point of view, and they're always fantastic. Yesterday, you wrote something saying wars are becoming existential, like it or not. But does this really also go through the problem that the international community and the U.S. have in, in reigning in Israel? Absolutely. I mean, this is the great difficulty. Uh, you know, there is a, a, a large disconnect between Israel and its allies on, on, on this issue. You know, the, for the U.S., uh, also for uh, the Arab nations, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc., um, you know, the, w in order to win, what they need is to end this war and to find some kind of solution uh, which will satisfy both the Palestinians and so on. The, the Saudis have made very clear just recently, um, you know, the, the deal that we were going to do with Israel is still on the yeah. table, but only if there is a Palestinian state. And yet, you know, within Israel, there's no appetite for that at all. Uh, the Palestinians are, at, you know, also in a kind of existential state. You know, there's 20,000 plus uh, who have been killed. Um, and it's very, very difficult. Once it's a war about you, once the perception is that it's a war about your existence, your, you know, your future is at stake, um, it's very difficult to get the kinds of compromises to do, you know, deals that will end the conflict short of some kind of cataclysmic outcome. So what is Anthony Blinken actually trying to achieve? It's, it's frankly sometimes unclear what the U.S. wants. They've, they've shown unwavered support for Israel, but they've also, you know, had more tempered comments. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, they, they, they set out, you know, it, it's, they, the U.S. is in a really difficult position. I mean, let's be frank. So in, on October the 7th, something, you know, horrific was done 
uh, the U.S. came out and said we have you know full support. We need to you know deal with the people who who did this. Um, and uh, but you know Israel has run with that. Uh, you have a, a, a government that is actually um, you know not a friend of uh, the Biden administration. Um, this is you know a, a, not a happy kind of alliance between these particular governments. Um, and uh, and and it's also the Israeli government. This particular uh, Israeli government is very opposed to any idea of a Palestinian state. Uh, has been always. Um, so it's it's extremely difficult. You know what Biden's trying to do is to and Blinken is is to get uh, the kind of consensus around you know amongst the Arab nations and so on and with the Israelis. Very very hard to do. Mark, thank you so much. As always, Mark Champion there from Bloomberg Opinion. Coming up, it's Bloomberg UK. This is Bloomberg.